Tēnā koutou. I might end up having to sit down. I've just had a new knee, but um, my people agreed to this, so, you know, in the service of our people, I've made sure I turned up today. Um, so I'm a Deputy Director General at Ministry for Primary Industries, and that's on the economic side of government. Uh, in my part of the world, there aren't any other Māori uh, at my level. And I think in terms of well-being of Māori whānau, that's probably one of the things that needs to be addressed reasonably quickly, is if you look out across the senior levels of um, bureaucrats in Wellington, something you notice immediately is the absence of Māori at a senior level. Or if they are um, in those senior roles, quite often they're there as um, uh, in order to make sure that um, tikanga is taken care of. But quite often the model that's been used over time is that you get given the salary, you get told that you're going to be on the um, leadership team, but then the resources to be able to read the reports or the different papers that are coming across the senior table and to be able to make comment on it or to influence major policy is absent. Um, so anyway, I'm, uh, <coughs> and I'm, another job I have at the moment is I'm also the senior responsible official for Northland uh, in the government's regional economic development program. And that means I report directly to um, a set of cabinet ministers on how we are going with developing the economy in Northland and a set of uh, different regions around the country including the East Coast and um, Bay of Plenty and also Manawatu Whanganui, all of which are areas that have high Māori populations have been identified by the government as requiring support to increase the economic activity in those areas and by doing that to raise the um, the number of employed people in those particular areas. So mine is Northland. As Hami said, I'm from uh, Kaikohe, although I grew up in South Auckland, and I'm always quite happy I grew up in South Auckland because I think when I went home, lived growing up in South Auckland, and particularly growing up with Pacific Islanders, is it gave you an edge because Pacific Islanders always take the piss out of you and quite often do various other activities to you as well. So by the time I got back to Kaikoura, I think I had an edge that a number of the people who had never left that area did not have. <laughs> okay. So um, I understand Joe Williams talked to you a bit earlier. I spent over a decade doing treaty settlements, both for the Ngāpuhi iwi and then as the Chief Executive of Crown Forestry Rental Trust. Um, technically, as we have a higher um, uh, income base, we should be getting better as a people. And I think the middle class and those involved in the activities around iwi are getting better off. But in towns like the one I come from, Kaikohe, there the symptoms of large parts of the whānau not getting better off are becoming increasingly more visible. Um, two tangis I went to last year, one was for a close friend of mine um, who was murdered and put in the bush, left there, and then somebody got a guilt pang and told the police where to dig him up. And uh, I went to his funeral, it was in Mangere. This was all to do with high level um, drug activity, but the, I knew him as a younger man. And when I went into the whare, even though there's supposedly millions of dollars in this trade, the tangi was in a two bedroom state house and it was raining, so you had to put planks out across the lawn. And when you got into the sitting room, there was no one there to do um, mahi or karanga or anything like that at all. And the thing that most got me too was that around the room there were only women. So all the men were off being he-men somewhere 
and the only people that were in the room were middle-aged or older women. And then someone I knew back in our young days, I caught up with her and she said to me, oh, I'm looking after five mukapuna now because we've had to take them off the parents because of their pee addiction. So that kind of struck me quite severely. And the second tangi that stands out from last year was um, uh, another, well, a nephew this time, who was shot in the street in Whangarei, again to do with the pee addiction. And um, at his tangi, the, what the residual to his tangi is that on the final day, the taumata and the kuya could no longer control the, um, the crowd because they were basically overrun by gang members and, um, and their entourages. And that, that particular tangi was televised. <coughs> so the taumata couldn't do its job any longer and the, and the kuya couldn't do their job any longer. Um, and then you ended up with uh, a motorcycle being buried in the grave, but only half buried because somebody obviously got a clever idea while they were burying the, the two papaku and put the motorbike in on top of it. What that means for that particular community at the moment is they now have to deal with what do we do about the half buried motorcycle? And also, what do we do about making sure that the next time there is a tangi, we can maintain our control or our tikanga over, um, over the proceedings? So both of those stood out to me last year as examples of when the whānau process is not working and when even at a hapu level, it's difficult for, um, for people to maintain the equilibrium of tikanga over 21st century activities. Um, then I went to a couple of really good tangi this year where things still worked. One was obviously um, in the Kingi Tanga. You don't go burying motorcycles half in the grave in the, in the middle of the Kingi Tanga. That was run um, perfectly. And also one in Te Opodi where the people are closely aligned to the church. And so that was run under the um, auspices of the church. But just comparing those two, on the one hand you have people who are still rock solid in their kaupapa and on the other side you have people who have been damaged severely by the effects of um, post-colonisation. <coughs> so, how does that come to economic development originally? We, when we first went up north to get this underway, all the, the mission was simply to increase the amount of economic activity. How do you get some roads built? How do you increase the tourism industry in that area? How do you get the farms into production, get some processing plants set up, get some manufacturing going, boat building, that type of thing? But the more you got into it, the more you realised that one of the main reasons why those areas need help in regional economic development is because they have such large Māori populations. And if you looked at, um, if you looked at Kaikohe, again, which is our town, that's the centre of Ngāpuhi. So people will always return there whenever their lives aren't going too well or whenever it's time to retire. So people go home because that's where they come from. And we did a study last year that showed there were 82,000 hectares of Māori land in a 50 kilometre radius of um, Kaikohe. 82,000 hectares. Now if that was under European title or if it was under European usage you wouldn't have unemployment in that particular area. And then when you started getting into it, the, um, the reason why it is that way is because over time from the individualisation of land title, and I think Joe Williams talked to you about that earlier, and then secondly in the 1950s in the post-war period when the 50 acre blocks could only support one family, so other families left, which includes people like me who ended up in South Auckland. And now in, from the 80s those 50 acre blocks don't support anyone anymore. So you've now got a whole lot of close on over 60,000 of that 82,000 hectares of Māori land which is in either short term lease or no use at all. 
So you can drive from Wilds in Northland, particularly between um, Moirawa and the Hokianga, and you can tell immediately wh where is the Māori land. So in terms of taking a look at um, <coughs> taking a look at how how does it, the economic activity fit in with the social activity, which I understand most of you are involved in, the whole goal has to be, on the one hand, to increase the number of jobs in any particular region, and then on the other side, to improve the ability of young people to be able to participate in those jobs. We did another study that came out earlier this year, and we interviewed 300 primary sector employers in the um, mid-north region as to their attitudes to employing locals. And the same things keep coming through over and over again. First of all, yes, we want to employ New Zealanders. Um, and then secondly, they come with a whole set of problems. The obvious one being inability to pass drug tests, but also the level of numeracy and literacy. And it isn't can you have NCA level two, it's simply can you understand instructions and convey information back to me in a timely fashion to be able to do this job. And then the third one is the, um, the proclivity for not turning up um, on Fridays or on Mondays. And that is a pretty good report to read. So any training programs that are to be done with young people have to take all of that into account. Um, one of the big things you find as well in these areas is that if Māori can't see the benefit for any activity occurring in the area, so you might see um, an example would be um, Carrington Estate. There's currently a proposal by a Chinese company to build a 700 bed um, tourism estate in, on Karikari Peninsula. But because the benefits of that have not been explained to Māori significantly or have not been done clearly, you end up with large parts of the Māori community um, opposing those activities. And the obvious answer has to be that there'll be long-term um, downstream uh, co-investment and employment and all the rest of it. But when people don't know how they are going to um, benefit from any of these, ec this economic activity, they will always oppose it. And Māori opposition is quite significant. I'm involved in aquaculture and um, irrigation and a whole range of other things, and it is always the same. Where people can't see there's going to be a benefit, they will continue to oppose. So I'll, I'll skip that. I, I guess this now comes down to um, what, whatever we try to do as government to support industry on the left hand side, on the economic side, if there is no corresponding and obvious um, social benefit on the right hand side, finding um, community support and acceptance of e economic development, therefore people saying yes we want this in our area and not opposing it, if you can't make the tie up that your people will get the jobs and then that means at the same time you have to develop the programs that will allow your young people to be able to get those jobs. So over the last couple of years um, when I first went to back to Kaikoura in this particular role there were 52 social programs um, in that town and you'd have to you'd have to really sincerely check whether it was getting the required result or not. I remember saying in one meeting um, when I said, do you do realise there's not um, 52 of these programmes in that town? And then a nice MSD lady who was at the meeting said, well, there's over 90 in Gisborne. So it's kind of like, you know, it, the, the issue is no longer do we have adequate resourcing going into these programs? It's are they targeted in the right manner? So we had a go at running a, um, uh, a not an education, employment or training program between 15 and 24 year olds out of Kaiko here. It was a 12 month program and um, out of that 
10 got full-time training, 13 are in employment, and five are um, undergoing individual work plans moving forward. And the key to that success was um, significant pastoral care. So these kids, the NEETS kids that are entering these particular programs have had like a good decade of failure um, in school. So you're basically running eight week programs as a waste of time unless you can develop uh, a pastoral care program that's gonna take them from point A to point B. And it also has to have support from uh, government agencies. At this stage, that was out of Wellington, but it would have to mean a re-gearing of the regional agencies to be able to think like this. And the other point, part that's missing is that you have to have the employers on board while you're doing the program. So we had a set of employers that were keen that if these kids reach this point, we will employ them. We also ran a um, Monica training program with these young men you can see in the photo. All of them have had um, time in jail and they were purposely picked for that too, that they haven't gone over the edge, they're not gang members yet, but they've all had run-ins with the law. And out of that crew, there was 11 on that and um, all of them had employment immediately after the program finished. And um, a couple of them have gone off to Australia and one has moved town and that, but the whole point was to say, if you had the, had the resources and you put them in the right place, what results can you get? Okay, so every now and then, how I think I even got invited here is I stumbled into a um, one of these hui. I realised at that time I was the only man in the room and definitely the only person from the economic part of government. But when I read this, I thought that's got to be the target for what we're um, aiming for. And my role and our part of government is to develop the economy so that you can put people into employment. In terms of Māori land, and this is my last slide, one of the things that became quite obvious is um, with that individualisation of title, and then in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, with people moving off that land, um, a lot of the resources that we had um, in an earlier time don't exist now. So uh, 4,000 hectare forestry block in the mid-north, well known to everyone. One of the big problems is that those people at an earlier time, 30 years ago, signed deals where there weren't um, clauses for reforestation. So the trees are cut, they're taken away, um, the rental is paid, and now the trees are lying on the ground. Uh, the, um, the waste is lying on the ground. And because of the ETS liabilities, you're caught in a space where Unless you get some support from some investor, you can't put those trees back in the ground and you have a liability to surrender ETS units. And the same thing is happening in the, um, in the beef and lamb area. So we have a collective of around 40,000 hectares in Northland that are um, land blocks coming out of settlement or, um, or returning from long-term lease and with the advent of fencing waterways in the next 10 to 15 years, those landowners will have no choice about fencing waterways. So for the average Māori land block, you'll be facing a bill of around three quarters of a million to put trees in the ground. So the seesaw idea is basically the why Māori don't want to go with investors, and there are plenty of investors, um, is because of the, of the fear of how the last lot of deals went. And secondly, the seesaw is heavily weighted towards the investor. The investor has capital, intellectual property, technology and market access. And really all we have at the moment, until we continue to develop other activities, is we have the land. And the land is only ever valued at its best alternative use. And yet to us, it's precious because it's taonga tuku ehu. But in terms of a commercial deal, it is basically what can be earned off this particular land block. And one of the things we are working on at the moment is how do you move that seesaw up so that it is 
more of a level playing field. Any questions? Space where we're putting together employment and training plans, so working towards broadening the capabilities. And um, who do you suggest we go to? So I've been talking with Minister Tolly. Who do you suggest we go to? Because we've got the priorities and we're connected with the people, but still unsure where to start. You know, so we've got the Nahere, the native forest, the podocarp trees. Um, to us, those are our assets, those are our taonga, and we want to build our people from that base. Yeah. So where do you suggest we start when we're looking at um, building the capability and the capacity of our people to sustain that? <coughs> so government has to always be independent broker, honest broker, but in terms of commercial deals, you actually need a commercial friend. So government can get, help you, including the stuff that we do, we can help you to get a business plan and do that type of thing, but that's not gonna help you to get into um, the commercial world. You are gonna need somebody that you trust, or and, um, an example is a couple of the key advisors we have at the moment that w the guy who works with all the, and he's, since been taken over by the iwi leaders is somebody who ran the dairy awards he also um, owns his own dairy farm uh, he was managing director of the biggest dairy farm in northland uh, he also helped out with Harmi and co as well so some of it is like look for look for who's farming in your area and, and looks like they know what they're doing and have they been long term in that area as well I'm off the hook. Thank you.